The most attractive aspect of a woman. Very sensitive. Ah, attractive. Anyway, I'm not sure. Sounds like that's it. Are you a quiet guard? And a bug grab. This was an eye gift. Oh, you could put it at the corners. Remember Star Wars? Most reviewers rush in and cover something while it's still relevant, like amateurs. I like to make the context to build for all the pieces to fall into place, and for everyone to completely stop giving a shit. If you prefer to move on with your life, then by all means, launch something else. But if you want to give this dead horse one last kick and its dead horse falls, then the force be with us. Like and subscribe. One of the most interesting things about oh, the right. is the split between audience and reviewer scores. It's almost the exact inverse of The Last Jedi. Critics now being the ones like basing the film and fans praising it. Critics call the film cowardly, an admission of EP, and a colossal failure of imagination. And if you're unsure of what any of that means, the movie ends with our Jedi hero facing down Palpatine in his throne room. Not a Palpatine like character, but the actual Palpatine. One who died. Why is he back? Oh, no, Palpatine gives a shit. This comes after a gratuitous sequence showing off Palpatine's old throne with the return of the Jedi sword recycled over. He beckons ready to. Strike me down. Strike me down. When she refuses, he opens a window so that she can see the giant space battle the rebels are losing against the Empire. One where. Too many of them! <laughs> and where a ground crew was tasked with blowing up an antenna. The Jedi, Palpatine, seduced to the dark side, redeems himself by saving our hero. The highest-ranking Star Destroyer gets blown up and crashes point-first into the surface below. And the good guys celebrate on a horse planet while Luke and Leia's theme plays. And in a moment that genuinely shocked me in the theater, the celebration scenes from the special edition of Return of the Jedi are repeated, just with a Star Destroyer editing. Think about that. This is the second time in some 30 years that the people of Cloud City have celebrated Palpatine's death, because this movie could not come up with anything new. Here's a drinking game for the alcoholics out there. Watch the behind-the-scenes documentary and take a shot every time someone mentions tying something back to the originals. Every time you turn around, you're going to see the black game. Let's try to link this last film all the way back to the very first film. Right. It's remote, Troy. Right. It's molded yeah. from yeah. the original bowl yeah. from a new home. The one that they used then, so that's exactly the same. Yeah. That's the grandchildren. That same thing that their predecessors should have done. Was it the first to die in it? We knew that the original story was going to see the death star. He came to be 
take off the original and have nice callbacks to them. We want to try and get that same callback with Ray looking in. It didn't have a glass so. We thought you'd finish off Star Wars as it's supposed to be. Tatooine, the whole thing. We thought, well, maybe this is the way to bring it to the So then to get this cool, it was once again a third time. I don't know this as a fact, but I assume that most fans would agree that Disney fucked this trilogy up in some way. If it wasn't with The Last Jedi, then maybe you think it was Rise of Skywalker. I say it happened right at the start, with The Force Awakens. It's a likable movie that's extremely well executed, but it is just a new hope again. There's no point in having such a large saga if it doesn't evolve into new phases. The prequels showed a democracy sliding into fascism. The originals showed that dictatorship being overthrown by a rebellion. Logically, to bring things full circle, this trilogy should have focused on the growth of a new democracy. And that's exactly what George Lucas was going to do in his treatments. He was drawing from the struggles of the new government in Iraq to tell a story about Leia's Republic battling against corruption and imperial remnants, with democracy ultimately prevailing and Leia turning out to be the chosen one. There was also Darth Maul with robot legs in there, which is... shit. Michael Arndt was taking too long to write the screenplay, so Lawrence Kasdan and J.J. Abrams tossed those ideas in the trash and decided to make a nostalgic homage to Star Wars instead. It was a madly absurd version of A New Hope, just to change the names. Instead of Tatooine, it's Jakku. Instead of the Death Star, it's Starkiller Base. It's frustrating to look through all the cool concepts that were rejected in favor of one-to-one -one recreations of what we've already seen. We think they may be putting up weeding. Most people were fine with this fan service because the fans hadn't been serviced in a very long time. The Force Awakens was seen as a palate cleanser for the prequels, and the next films could do something new. But that's the problem. How do you tell a new story when you've set us up to tell the old one again? Instead of a new phase, we're starting right from the same position A New Hope did, as if the record is skipping. The original trilogy may as well have never happened. I'm not going to waste time arguing that The Last Jedi was good. I already tried. But you have to appreciate that Ryan Johnson had the difficult job of doing all the dirty work that The Force Awakens avoided, not just in terms of finding a new story, but in making sense of the one that we had just heard. The Force Awakens told us that Luke abandoned his friends in shame and didn't return to save Han's life or to help Leia when she desperately needed him, even though we know he should be able to sense these things happening. They were indeed... the future, you see. It shirked any responsibility for showing us what that Luke was thinking and left his characterization up to the next film. Brian Johnson handled it by extruding from what J.J. Abrams had given him, drawing a straight line out from the previous film, in Johnson's words, rather than trying to subvert expectations. Ryan Johnson not only answered the hard questions about Luke, but found a way to tell his own story in the process, stacking layers and layers of meaning onto the foundation he inherited. And it's hard to see works to get a nostalgia writing series off of that rig. The Rise of Skywalker works even harder to get back on it. In a clearer way, this slightly more familiar dynamic of the the pupil, that's much more exciting going into nine, the notion of now we just have Kylo as the one that they have to deal with. You say it's uninteresting to repeat the master and apprentice dynamic again? That means we're doing it. Not too much. We're going to say we aren't. Serving another master. No. Even though we specifically brought Palpatine back for Kylo to have a bigger villain to overthrow again. Some of the retconning is outright petty. The moment Ray cocked her arm back to toss the saber, I knew, oh god, they're going to have Luke catch it to undo that moment from The Last Jedi. And they did. This weapon deserves more respect. This is the kind of talk you expect to see on Twitter, not the silver screen. Chris Terrio insisted that this wasn't a snub, but why return to this specific moment otherwise? After Luke gave his life to become the symbol of hope, did we need to bookend the saber toss to prove that he learned something? It's hard to shake the feeling that Terrio didn't understand what The Last Jedi was about. Fear can be here. Not really. Ryan Johnson specifically based his script on the idea that it couldn't be fear keeping Luke there. I knew, because it's Luke Skywalker, who I grew up with, as a hero, I knew the answer couldn't be cowardice. He couldn't just be hiding, and I knew it had to be something positive. He thinks he's doing the right thing. It was fear that kept me here. Ray's parentage was right on because they thought fans didn't want to be told that their theories didn't matter, so they just redid the answer. No way, correct, Imagine someone pulling this shit with Return of the Jedi. Is Darth Vader my father? No. Obaka, your father is. When the mystery of Rain's parentage was introduced in The Force Awakens, you probably assumed that she was related to one of the characters we know and that she was left there for an important reason. 
My lazy guess was that Tim is Luke's daughter was hidden to protect her from a villain on the dark side. Because that's the trope, that our humble heroes are actually important people predestined for greatness. Protect you both from the editor, but didn't make your father Who is his father? The listener. Right being no one wasn't about subverting your expectations. The answer challenged her to move forward as her own person and showed Ray that her future was not dictated by her past. It also tied into the theme that anyone can be a hero, and that bloodlines and destiny don't decide who's important in the story. Tapping into this power in yourself and having it, I like the idea of disconnecting that from lineage. I think that feels in a anyone can be president type way. And for your in this movie, if someone had told her, yes, here's the answer, you are so-and-so's daughter, here's your place in this world, here you go, that would be the easiest thing she and the audience could hear. This is going to be hard, and you're going to have to stand two feet in for some of this. It's no accident that the film mentioned the Skywalker lineage so often. Attention of your bloodline. Bloody Skywalker blood. It left interesting suggestions about Rey's power that didn't need to be answered. Maybe the Force was balancing itself through Rey. Or maybe she just had the right spirit and determination. Nope. It's just Palpatine DNA. Look at those midichlorians go. Sheave jeans, baby! <laughs> Palpatine's genome. It's just DNA. Behold, the full power of my midichlorian count. The film doubles down hard on the idea that the Force is exclusively genetic. My mother's daughter of the Emperor. Your father was the son of the Emperor. And they must have realized this halfway through writing because they gave Finn a disposable moment with the Force. The that signal's coming from that command ship. How do you know? See? Anyone can still use the Force. You just, you know, won't be important. You'll sit on the sidelines and watch the royal family members do royal person stuff. Whatever drama Ray Palpatine was supposed to generate was based on it being the hardest answer for her. But Ray being hidden to protect her from evil isn't the hardest answer. That's exactly what she wanted to hear all along. That her parents loved her and left her for a reason. You had a father who loved you. He gave the doubt about you. This desperate retcon was apparently decided after filming began. Did you know? about the parentage that at the beginning there was toying with like an obi-wan connection and then it really went to that she was no one and then it came to episode nine and jj pitched me the film and was like oh yeah palpatine's granddaddy and i was like awesome and then two weeks later he was like oh we're not sure so he kept changing. so then even i filming and I wasn't sure what the answer was going to be. And it demonstrates the absolute refusal of this script to allow anything interesting for The Last Jedi to stand. Even if we've got no better ideas, we're checking those fan service boxes. At this point, I have to apologize and make a retraction, because just before the movie came out, I said this. But there was an arc set for the trilogy, and JJ said he loved Ryan's script so much he was jealous he didn't make it himself. And after seeing Rise of Skywalker, there's no way either statement is true. It seemed plausible at the time. Even if you take Abrams and Terrio at their word that they were genuinely trying to embrace what Ryan Johnson did, their every attempt at complicating The Last Jedi led to a less interesting plot than what he left them, and one that manages to commit a lot of the mistakes that fans accused his movie of making. Luke dying for no reason was a common one, but he died overexerting himself, performing the most extreme use of the Force seen in the series. In this film, Rey actually dies for no reason, unless holding up those lightsabers required the Force. <laughs> People thought The Last Jedi faked them out with cheap moves like Leia being blasted into space, but Leia's survival didn't render that scene meaningless. It put Leia in a coma and set Poe off on his arc to become her replacement. Here, Chewie's non-death pretty much is meaningless, as is C-3PO's minutes-long memory loss. I don't know why the film builds this up into some powerful moment, because it's happened before. At the protocol droids, my wife. What? And they undercut any dramatic weight it might have had by making it clear that R2 has data backups. Doesn't R2 back up your memory? Which are used minutes later. So, fuck it. What are we even doing here? We're wasting our time. This is already really negative, and I don't want this to just be a tired and abrasive rant. So let's take a positivity break to talk about all the things the movie has going for it. It looks great. The emphasis on practical effects in this trilogy continues to pay off. I always like going on vacation. It's a much more real crap.
happy to the scene. I just don't know why. And I know when seeing sequences like the Pasana Festival that these would have been CGI back in the prequels. But here, they actually had an army of real actors out in the real world. The film delivered all the spectacle any fan could have asked for. <laughs> the actors are all doing their best in spite of the material and cement that they were perfectly cast. In fact, I would argue that this trilogy managed the most consistently good performances in the saga. Richard E. Grant's character is just a marvelous asshole. We've seen space Nazis before, but this guy looks like he wakes up eager to write get rolled. Leia scenes always feel like out-of-context audio stuck together. It looks like I'm making excuses. Don't tell me what things look like, tell me what they are. But I commend them for finding some kind of conclusion for her. Carrie Fisher's death was a huge blow to the storyline, and it's nice to see that they worked around it without writing her out completely. I like that the Force Bond concept was taken further, and the fusion of different settings was a really cool visual. I also like Kylo's exchange with Han, because this is a moment that actually feels like it was earned and built towards throughout the trilogy. Why did you hate your father? Give me an honest answer. I did. You struck me down at night. I'll always be. <laughs> Just like your father. Maybe it doesn't make total sense that a memory of Han is appearing like a force ghost, but it has real emotional weight to see Kylo relive that moment as Ben this time. And then he doesn't speak a word for the rest of the movie. Adam Driver as Kylo Ren is one of the most consistently praised parts of this trilogy, and they apparently had no idea what to do with him after his turn. He just ceases to be a character and amounts to little more than a lightsaber delivery board. He begins fiercely determined to eliminate any threat to his power, but he and the movie alike forget that he's the Supreme Leader about halfway through and he seems just fine with random officers supplanting him. There was a lot of the cast all being together in this one, and that we would have that great chemistry front and center. But it doesn't matter for much when the characters have next to nothing to do. Their scenes are mostly just hollow banter. So, Batman. Him. Always. When you were sinking in the sand, you said, I never told you. I'll tell you later. They'll be waiting for us at the Falcon. Yeah, they'll throw us in the pits of grit. Yeah. I haven't built you this tent since, since we fell into the pits of grit. Yeah. Finn is mostly there to shout other people's names, which has been an unfortunate trend from the start. <laughs> The best he gets is a conversation with other defecting troopers, which highlights how much conflict Finn should have about gunning these people down at this point. We were conscripted as kids. All of us. All of us here were stormtroopers. We mutinied at the Battle of- bah, 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 bah. Die, motherfuckers! That same raid scene exposes how little Poe has learned since the last film, where his mission to infiltrate the Supreme Leader's ship failed because of the tiniest mistake and nearly ended the rebellion. They try the same thing again, but without any plan at all this time. They just run into the most heavily guarded ship in the universe and start blasting, which is especially dumb because they have Rey, who can do this. It's okay that we're here. Why not just do that from the start and have what you need brought to your ship? We're looking for a prisoner. Add his belongings. Okay, now no problem with that. Their raid fails, Poe gets shot, and they're only spared from execution because of dumb luck. There's no moment in this film where Poe demonstrates his growth as a leader. He completely freezes in the final battle and just bears witness as Lando is the one that saves the universe. Rose has about as much a role in the film as these 2D storyboard cutouts. Terrio explained this by saying that they couldn't successfully integrate her into the footage of Leia, but that only confirms that they never intended to give her anything to do other than stand in the background in the first place. When you say that they're going on, they're going on this adventure together, yeah. does that include everyone we're seeing, including including Kelly Marie? Uh, I will say that. Uh, ah. uh, how dare you! Hello, darkness, my old friend. Even if you hate what The Last Jedi did to Luke, it at least gave him depth and an arc to work through. I think it's Mark Hamill's best performance, and you can glean so much about Luke's mental place just from the way that he looks. This time, he stands around looking like he's in a bad wig, with a few lines of superficial dialogue leading to him becoming a lightsaber delivery boy. After handling The Last Jedi with such professionalism, Mark Hamill deserved a better part than this. You'll take both sabers to Exegol. You see, that's Palpatine's weakness. Two lightsabers. Also, I forgot I knew you were his granddaughter. Who are you? I made fun of fans for calling everything they don't like fan service last time, but some of these scenes literally are fan service I read online after The Last Jedi. So many people thought Luke should have raised his X-Wing and flown to Kraid in person, because everything has to call back to an old moment we like, and this film does it. Hey, did you get the wing back on there? Because you might need it. Oh no! It's not hard to rhyme with old moments. Ray wanted to be an X-Wing pilot, now she is one. Chewie didn't get a medal, now he has one. 
but you could stitch a thousand of these feel-good moments together and they would never amount to a good story. Nostalgia can't paper over a movie failing its characters. The Force working with you. Ray is the only one with anything substantial to go through, and it's a rehash of two arcs we've seen before. The idea that the heroes descended from the villain worked with Luke and Vader because it was clear, even before the prequels explicitly spelled it out, that Luke's life had a lot of parallels with his father's. Ray has nothing in common with Palpatine. Her life as a scavenger bears no resemblance to anything we saw of his. And her parents, one a direct clone of Palpatine, weren't evil. They stretch this faux drama thinnest when she gives up on Luke's island. I'm never leaving this place, I'm doing what you did. After coaxing Luke out of exile and witnessing his story's resolution, it makes no sense for a character with her perspective on those events to arbitrarily decide to do the same thing. After being widely derided as a supernaturally perfect Mary Sue for two films, she suddenly has to hide because she's in imminent danger of turning completely evil. Do you buy it? When you saw this in the trailer, did you think, even for a moment, that Rey might actually go bad? This is what they staked the finale of Star Wars on. A laughable pull to the dark side caused by a last-minute feigned genetic connection to a long obsolete character. The other arc that Rey repeats is the one that she just completed setting aside her past and not letting her parentage define her. Only this time, she won't forge her own path. She's just trading one important lineage for the other. Ray Skywalker. I think she gave the smarter answer earlier in the film. Just right. There's one other element holding together the fan service and Last Jedi retcons, and that is absolute filler. The fetch quest consumes half the film, and you can connect Star Wars to Kevin Bacon in fewer degrees than it takes them to find the magical crystal they're after. There's so much of this junk that the film balloons to one of the longest running times in the series and has to be frantically paced to get through it all. Oh, I'm here to kill you. You are insane. Okay, hi dog. You are my favorite sick doggy dog. An editor named Mike Nichols did a recut of The Phantom Menace and helped kick off a fan edit movement that continues to this day. Trying to, I don't know where the trigger is. Oops, wrong one. Maybe this one. Nope. For Attack of the Clones, he cut 40 minutes out of the film using shortcuts like this. That little dubbed-in line allowed the movie to completely skip over the 50s diner because it was unnecessary padding. That's the kind of hatchet work this film needed. For example, maybe 3PO doesn't refuse to translate the knife. Where's the wayfinding? And while we're at it, maybe Chewie and the dagger don't get taken away. Between those cuts, a full 30 minutes would be freed up, which could allow other scenes to actually breathe. And how many things of value would be missed? Babu Frick? Oh, was a smuggler? You could stick the Palpatine revelation somewhere else, or better yet, don't relitigate Ray's origin and devote that time to something better. But it works in the film's service that things are so rushed, because the writing holding all of this together is so poor that any time to process it would undo everything. It's the Three Stooges Syndrome, where so many dumb ideas are crowding their way into your head at once that none can get through. My favorite character in the series is now Ochi, the Sith. If you follow the story the movie gives you, Ochi was dispatched to find Rey so that Palpatine could use her as a vessel for his spirit. Given that Palpatine was falling apart, one has to assume that this was a high-priority job for his very best guy. Ochi finds Rey's parents and immediately flies him off the planet without looking for Rey. Which I say because she was actually screaming at him the whole time. How many other five-year-olds are out in the open desert of Jakku? He asks where Rey is and they tell him, not on Jakku, which he believes. Yeah, she could be anywhere! He then kills them both without doing any of the mind-probing stuff that's all over the series, because I guess Palpatine didn't teach him any of that. He must not have come from a midichlorian rich lineage. He then travels to Basana. I assume he's just searching every Tatooine clone in the galaxy, and gets stuck in quicksand 20 feet from a ship and then eaten by a snake. Ochi, the Jedi Hunter! There's a joke theory about Jar Jar being a Sith Lord, and this is what Darth Jar Jar would look like. I unironically want a Disney Plus spin-off following Ochi's bumbling adventures. Fuck Obi-Wan, fuck Lando, fuck Cassian Andor, make this one happen. The film saves its dumbest for last, with Palpatine's return being every bit the disaster it had the potential to be. We knew that this has always been a story of Skywalkers and Palpatines. There was only one Palpatine, and he died, meaningfully. We were done with him. 
Ian McDermott is a great actor and he was one of the few characters to shine in the prequels. The appeal was in watching how precisely he manipulated the other characters. That part of him didn't make it through the cloning process. He instructs Kylo Ren to kill Rey even though his plan requires her alive. Kill the girl. I wanted you dead. Why? He's not testing Kylo for any deeper purpose and seems to have no interest in him beyond getting Rey. Rey arrives determined to kill him. I did not know that he and destroy him. And he says the one exact thing that will stop her from doing it. That is what I want. Nice work, Iago. He would have had better luck with this move. I do me! Oh, don't kill me! When Rey and Kylo team up, he realizes that they're a dyad and decides to level up his clone body with their force power instead. He's really just kind of winging it until finally his spell reflects off Harry's wand and kills him. With 30 years of time, he planned things out about as well as this trilogy. The only thing he really has going for himself is a massive fleet. The Sith fleet will increase our resources 10,000 fold. And how did the Final Order build a fleet 10,000 times more powerful when the First Order had the advantage of stealing resources from all over the galaxy? I doubt the supply convoys were passing through those gravity wells, so Exegol must have some incredible resources. And even if you hand wave that question, why did Palpatine announce his plan for revenge before his ships were ready? Almost every time the Rebels have been presented with one thing they need to blow up, they've blown that thing up. Their explosion track record is incredible. How is he still not taking them seriously as a threat? Get your ships off the planet, then announce your sinister plans to Fortnite. And even ignoring how dumb all of that is, Victory is explicitly tied to trapping the Final Order on Exegol. They're close, come on! But the first antenna is never destroyed. Then we might use that target. Switch out the source of navigation signal to this ship. Couldn't they just reactivate that one and start again without missing a beat? Okay, fire it back up, boy! And why does the Final Order have to use an antenna to broadcast the way out anyway? Nav can't tell which way's up out there. They use a signal from a navigation tower like this one. The antenna can't literally be for telling the ships which way is up, because that's stupid and the crew could do that by looking out the window. I wanted to be fair, so I looked up what the antenna was doing and Wikipedia confirms that it was guiding the fleet through the wormhole stuff. And that raises a thousand questions. Ray uses the Wayfinder to leave a trail that millions of ships can easily follow. Couldn't a single TIE Fighter do the same thing? The Final Order doesn't have a Wayfinder, but that antenna was broadcasting something. They obviously had some kind of data to allow passage through. Why does their data have to be streamed in real time? They can't put it on a USB stick? And why only two antennas? They built a fleet of a million fully staffed Death Stars, but couldn't spring for even four or five Sith routers? Enough that the Rebels couldn't knock them all out at once? And even ignoring all of that, those million Rebel ships should conceivably have no trouble following those breadcrumbs again if they want to. The First Order was everywhere in the galaxy. Couldn't they capture even a single one of these civilian vessels and gain access to Exegol again? What's stopping the Final Order from using Ray's breadcrumbs? How did so many random ships manage to tune into that signal in the first place? If there was a secret access code for it, it must have been broadcast to the entire galaxy for this many people to show up. And wouldn't that be easy for the Empire to find and crack? They tracked Ray across the universe using a necklace. I'm sure they can handle this. The film is very vague about how many Star Destroyers were blown up, and maybe they were hoping they could paper over these plot holes by suggesting that every single ship was destroyed. But even in that scenario, what about the First Order? The Final Order wasn't even a known factor until a few days ago. Destroying this new fleet does nothing for the Empire the Rebellion was already losing to. Also, at least one Sith Destroyer is still out there and is more mobile and dangerous than either Death Star was. I guess killing the bad guy again led to all that stuff blowing up really easily. These are fantasy movies, and you have to allow for suspension of disbelief. But this film pushes well beyond the threshold where suspension is possible. It's not nitpicking to tear the plot apart like this. The writing is so bad that the critical plot points don't even function at the surface level. The only way to make sense of it is with the thought that they wanted Return of the Jedi's ending again, but even they realized they couldn't do another Death Star. So they fragmented it into a lot of smaller ships, but still wanted the simplicity of that single exploding thing that would lead to victory. But they couldn't find a way to make it work, and did it anyway, and hoped you were too dumb to notice. That's a summary of Rise of Skywalker as a whole. A movie that gave up halfway through doing something utterly unoriginal. The end of this saga has to feel surprising, but also inevitable. It wasn't surprising that the movie ended on another callback to A New Hope. The last trilogy ended the same way. But it did feel inevitable that the ultimate conclusion of the saga would be more nostalgic pandering. 
The ending of a series can have a powerful effect on the earlier movies. The prequels aren't great, but they're slightly elevated once you've seen Revenge of the Sith and understand the full arc. Knowing that Luke turns his father in the end adds another layer to their scenes together. Rise of Skywalker does almost nothing but depreciate the films before it. It's harder to enjoy The Force Awakens knowing that its mystery boxes were utterly empty, and that its ideas crescendoed into just another nostalgia movie. It goes without saying that The Last Jedi received a retroactive abortion. And for a movie that leans so heavily on Return of the Jedi, it takes a dump on Vader's sacrifice by reframing it as basically just causing Palpatine to prestige. The movie is so bad that, having admonished Star Wars fans for being so negative, I can't talk about it without becoming a total hypocrite. I went in hopeful and open-minded and tried to encourage others to do the same, never suspecting that the script would be borderline detestable, not because it's poorly written, but because of how wittingly regressive it is. If the movie is this bad, then why do a lot of people seem to like it? Reading through the positive audience reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, there's a lot of really good, great, fun, nostalgia, feel good, epic, fond memories, cool stunts, good movie, it was Star Wars, tied together, ride, awesome, 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 action, awesome, fun elements you expect. Awesome. Having Lei and Luke. Best movie. Special effects. Loved it. Graphics. I had a great time at the movies. Fight scenes. Applause emojis. Nice. Perfect. Fitting. I love Star Wars. Along with the expected amount of Last Jedi bashing. Never before have I seen such a shitload of nothing. I haven't come across any argument in favor of this movie that doesn't hinge on fan service. I don't want to shame anyone for liking Rise of Skywalker, because the one thing it definitely has going for it is that it's entertaining. It is enjoyable to watch if you just stop thinking and let the familiar sights and sounds wash over you. But it's ironic that the film ended up this way, since that's exactly what people were afraid of when Colin Trevorrow was put in charge of Nine. Based on the Jurassic World movies, people thought he would end the series with nothing but dumb spectacle. His leaked script actually seems like it was the more thoughtful one. Wanna hear what's in it? No. Fuck you. Rose, Finn, and Poe go on a mission to destroy a First Order shipyard. Yes, Kelly Marie Tran was in this one, and their detonators failed to damage the structure. Ray had been following the mission against Poe's orders and saves them, and a few things are demonstrated right from the start. Poe was actually making decisions as a leader and believed Ray was too important to the Rebellion to risk on this job. Ray has fused Luke's saber with her staff to symbolically make the hero's sword into her own weapon, instead of just pointlessly igniting it after the movie is over. And the effect of Luke's sacrifice is immediately visible as the slaves building the ships recognize Rey as a Jedi and unite to help her escape. The script provides a lot of moments like this to establish how near revolt the universe seems to be. Finn is grabbed by a dying trooper on the way out and is disturbed to recognize the face he sees in the broken mask, already doing more with this character than Rise of Skywalker. They board a newly built Star Destroyer and Rey mind tricks the skeleton crew into flying them out. Inside, they discover an arsenal of weapons and vehicles that could be used to launch a major strike against the First Order. As far as heists go, this beats the shit out of the one in the actual movie. Luke's role is far larger, with his ghost continuing to train Rey in haunting Kylo Ren. Rey questions the Jedi's concept of balance when it seems to perpetuate a never-ending cycle between light and dark. Later, Lando also acknowledges the apparent futility of everything they did in the originals. I like that the script addresses these things, as it widens the scope of the final episode to focus on the Aeonium problems occurring throughout the trilogies. This is where the second draft splits off from the publicly leaked one, so it's second-hand information from here. Poe is reluctant to fly the very conspicuous stolen destroyer back to the base, but is forced to when it falls under attack from the First Order. They manage to rescue some rebels, but Leia is wounded and dies soon after. BB-8 finds maps of all Rebel bases in the Destroyer system, and they realize that their base was just the first in a sweep that will wipe the Rebellion out. They need to warn the others, but the First Order has blocked all communication in the galaxy. Rey, Poe, and Chewie leave to find an ancient Jedi broadcast system that's immune to the jamming, while Finn and Rose try to recruit fighters. In the first draft, this happens on Coruscant, while the later ones seem to change it to some random world. I like Coruscant better, and that's what all the art shows, so let's pretend it's there. The Knights of Ren have more scenes, but still end up mainly being there for one big fight. At least in this version, you get to see Chewie toss one in the air and blast it, while Rey force pulls one into her saber blade and kills the leader with an unexpected blast of lightning. This idea seems to have made it into Rise of Skywalker. Rose gets captured and tortured for the location of the stolen destroyer, which is now the main rebel ship, while Finn finds the underground resistance and has a great moment where he convinces a stormtrooper to defect. 
He leads the citizens to revolt and a squad of stormtroopers join them, leading to a giant battle on the streets where the First Order's own weapons and soldiers are turned against them. The fight turns grim when First Order reinforcements pour in, but Rey gets the signal out at the Jedi Temple and Lando shows up with thousands of civilian ships, as in the movie. Hux detaches the capital ship from the city and attempts to flee, but Rose reprograms its navigation systems before escaping, causing it to crash into the sun. There were a lot of potential ways for this final episode to connect all nine movies together. I think this was a decent one. Star Wars has always been about space Nazis, propaganda, coups, and war, obviously. No one liked the prequels being so political at the time, but while the story was not well told, it was prescient of George Lucas to lay out how fascism spreads. A leader doesn't just take over from the top. It's the fear of losing something, the glacial erasure of norms. All of this is unusual. Forcefully repeated lies. The Jedi Council on Control. And a loss of faith in democracy and its supporting institutions that twist the people into welcoming tyrants in as heroes. It's appropriate then to end the series with the people rectifying their mistake and fighting from the bottom up to win democracy back. To be fair, Rise of Skywalker tried to carry this message, but it was an aside, buried under the cliché of blowing up a thing again. Its big idea to tie the series together was bringing back the guy from the old movies, and that, that was it. Duel of the Fates ends with Rey finally achieving real balance by accepting her dark side and embracing all of the Force. She starts training a new generation of Grey Jedi that will hopefully avoid the mistakes of the past. This is the kind of finality that Rise of Skywalker lacked. Not that everything needs to be completely settled forever, but in the movie there's nothing stopping the dark side from rising again, or a new Republic from failing again, or even Palpatine from coming back in a third body. But there are major problems with Trevorrow's script that make it clear why it was rejected. The fact that I could summarize it barely mentioning Kylo Ren is a red flag. He has nothing compelling to do in the story and is wasted on a quest to obtain some kind of Sith power-up. He still turns good at the last minute and even revives Rey with his life force, but he's an uncomplicated villain with a weak motivation up until that point. As meager as it was, Rise of Skywalker did more with it. This version also needlessly meddles with Rey's past to reveal that Kylo Ren killed her parents. I'd still take this over her being Palpatine Jr., but it's bad. Trevorrow has shamelessly lifted ideas before and that happens again, with Rey covering her damaged eyes with a blindfold and using the Force to see in the final act. The scene where Rey speaks to all the past Jedi is here, but it's a little more like Harry Potter's station scene and that she's given a choice to stay among them. I have to go back, haven't I? Oh, that's up to you. The important thing is that this story had good ideas that were too good to throw out. It was the connective tissue holding them together that needed to be redone. Late Brackett's first draft of Empire Strikes Back wasn't that great, but all the basic story beats were established that a rewrite can make all the difference. In this case, two of them still wasn't enough to get there. Why am I watching this? I don't even know what's here about Star Wars. So just a background info, I am a German, I'm now trying to pronounce the words, names in German of the replicast. Um, I hope you all have fun. Okay, so at the top of my list we have our community person Adler. In German you pronounce him Adler. Syllables Adler. Then Adler. Adler. The full name of the Adler Akku also translates to Administrationsdatenverarbeitung Logistik Replica. So directly after the King of Chads, we have the U, or how they are correctly pronounced in German, Eulen. Not Ewels or Eules, Eulen. Or if you just want to have one of them, I it's see. So that's why an is the two syllables, oil. not a uh, again, oil. an Euler, uh, not oil. a Euler. And if you ask yourself what the replica for Euler is, it is einfache universale leichte replica. After that, we have Falcon, or in German Falcon. Again. As was the both before them, two syllables, pal -ke. Again, pal -ke. If you want to have more than just one falke, 
would have Falken. Not Falkes. Falken. For Falken, we have actually one of the easiest acronyms, which is Führungskommando Leiteinheit Replica. So, these were pretty easy. Now, we get to the Aras. Or the Ara. Um, the funny thing is, I don't know what they smoked when creating that name, because how I, how I know it from the community, the Aras are Makars. So, <laughs> Makar in German is a Papagei. I'm not shitting you, it's a Papagei. Again, um, it's three syllables this time. Pa, pa, guy. Again, pa, pa, guy. Or if you want to have more than one, it would be papagayan. Again, papagayan. I don't know how they can, came up with ara because we have no and absolutely no word of that name in our language. A papagay. Okay? It's a papagay. ARA also stands for Allzweck Reparatur Arbeiter Replica. So, after that, we have the, how they are called in the community, the Calibris. Um, that's not how you pronounce them. In German, obviously, in German you call them Colibris. Again, three syllables as with Papagei. Co-bri. Again, co -bri. Colibri. If you want to have more than one, it would be Colibris. The Colibri acronym is Commando Leiteinheit Bioresonance Technik Replica. So after the Colibris, we have the Kant who ruined everything, or how the community likes to call her, Elster. Um, in a, okay, in the community it's Elster, but um, in Germany it is Elster. Two syllables. El star. Again, El star. Or if you want to have multiple El stars, <laughs> you would say El star. Again, El star. One El star, two El star. Okay? The acronym for the dirty crater is Landvermessung Schrägstrich Schiff Technica Replica. Okay, so next up we have the, how the community at least calls them, Jainas. Um, weird thing is, in Germany we don't have Jainas, or how it's pronounced in German, Nina. Um, it's, I think, a South African, no, South Asian bird, at least I heard so. I have never, at least in my region, seen a Nina, or how they are also called in Germany, Beo. Like, I, I never even heard these names, so I'm trying my best. I never heard it in my entire life, but just how they are written, I'm trying to pronounce them. It's Nina, or Beo. Again, Nina, or Beo. Uh, the syllables in both cases are two. Nina, again, Nina. Or B O. And if you want to have multiples of them, it would be minus, yeah, minus or Bios. For the big girl, the acronym is Minenarbeiter Nukleartechnik Hochsicherheitsreplika. Okay, now we have a unit that isn't even in the game. Uh, the community pronounces them Schnapper. Um, the funny thing about them is, um, I looked it up because, like, Schnapper is a German word. It means grabber. Um, but the thing is, I researched it and it has a totally different name because of a certain letter in the German alphabet named, the, named an A, like an A with two points about, uh, above it. And we have the Südseeschnetter, or in short, the Schnetter. 
Okay, that's a lot of syllables. The first one has four syllables. The second one has two syllables. So, again, Süd, See, Schnepp, Pau. Or, Schnepp, Pau. Again, long and short version. Süd, See, Schnepp, Pau. Or in short, Schnepp, Pau. Um, if you want to have multiples, it would also still remain Schnepper. Um, again, I I don't live in that direction, like northern part of Germany, maybe they are more common there, but I have never heard of a Schnepper. Um, <laughs> yeah. The funny thing about the Schnepper is that that thing was probably designed to fight with the shotgun that um, Adler or Adler had um, because the Schnapper or the acronym of the Schnapper translates to Schwere anti panzer replica Okay, so next up we have the Star or how the community usually calls them a star um, Germany, we, as I said, as I ever mentioned, the Star Two syllables for one, I really couldn't tell you, but you would have a syllable, you would go sta r again, sta r or you would simply pronounce it as one syllable sta. Um I think if you would if you would want to have multiples, you would say stare. Like that's just a sta with an E at the end. Stare. Sta stands for Sicherheitstechniker auf sehr replica by the way. So next up is the stork. Um, the stork or storch or however they're pronounced. Um, in German we call them Storch. That's two syllables. Storch. Like after the R and the CH, which is like a certain letter rule in German, it just cuts there. Again, Stor, stor. If you would want to have multiple ones, the O needs to become an Ö. Again, an O with two points above it. Störchen. Multiple. Storch. Störchen. So, the last known acronym for today stands for Sicherheitstechniker Controller. Replica. Um, controller is an English word, I just want to make that clear, because the German word would mean Controller. So after the Storch, we have the, I think the community called them Kranich, or something along those lines. In German we pronounce them Kranich. Again, two syllables with a lot of them, and also two syllables. It's a Kranich. Again, pretty easy. Kranich. Kranich. Want to have multiples? Would say Kranich. Again, Kranich. So Chris also said that there are three other planets that are pronounced in German, but Vignetta is not a German name. I don't know how you would come to that conclusion, but it is not. I can assure you. Um, the only two ones are Rotfront, which means something like. Red Front and Heimat, which means home. So that's basically the plot relevant part of the video. Now I'm just going to shitpost even more. Like this whole video is just a pretty, well, it's not even elaborate, it's just a shitpost. Um, but I have a little bird book in front of me. I have it like I'm since I was four or so, I don't know. Um, but it's called Was fliegt denn da? Or What is flying there by Cosmo Mini. So I'm just trying to speedrun all the bird names. I don't know if I... I probably have something like Elstar is also in here. But like I said, I'm just going to try to speedrun that. Blaumeise, Kohlmeise, Kleiber, Gartenbaumläufer, Wintergoldhähnchen, Zipzalp, Mönchgrasmücke, Sa Zaunkönig, Rotkehlchen, Hausrotschwanz, Haussperlich, 
oder? Der Spaß. Ähm, Sperlitz or Distelfink, Bauchfink, Grünling, Impel or Dampf, nee, Dumpfaff, Golddammer, Mehlschwalbe, Mehlschwalbe, Rauchschwalbe, Mauersegler, Eisvogel, Bauchstelze, Weltlärche und Specht, Starr, auf First Double, Amsel, Bach, Olga, Drossel, Türkentaube. <lacht> 